Okay, without further ado, it is four o'clock. Thank you all so much for joining us for our third general meeting of winter quarter. Um, the field, the field, the psychology in the field is our topic today. If you have not yet, be sure to sign in with the link that will be put into chat as well as scanning the QR code that also works. So for our upcoming events for both week six and week seven, we have office hours both weeks, but with week six specifically this Friday, we have our share circle and right after that, our food lab circle, a uh, food lab social. And then for week seven, we have all these lovely events that we will go more into as we proceed in the slide. So first off with the share circle, it's midterm season, you're doing a lot. So what exactly are you doing to stay positive? Be sure to discuss your strategies, just discuss positivity as a whole with our share circle this Friday at Multipurpose Room 1 at the Student Success Center. And this does grant you one activity point. And if I could have Jocelyn speak on this. Um, so we're having a food lab social on Friday, February 17th from seven to nine. Um, it's going to be a downtown roofside at the food lab. And if you go, you get one activity point and you can see the location is on. There also will be carpool available. So if you have not yet, be sure to fill out the carpool availability form uh, if you need a ride. And you will be meeting after the share circle around 7.05 so that they can take you to the food lab. Our second community service is Food Bank. You can still sign up at the center until this Saturday. You do get three activity points. Be sure to sign up with the link. And then after you are there, you take a picture to show that you're there and then submit this proof form. All righty. So next, we actually have our first challenger discussion of the quarter. This will be on the psychology of magic. So please do join Vin. Vin will be presenting on magic psychology and uh, I believe he will actually be showing some tricks as well. So if you're curious and you think you can actually figure out the trick, be sure to check this out. It will be at the Goldman Library. The Goldman Library is on the third floor of the psychology building. And this will be Friday, February 24th. But if you are just in general curious and you would like to present on your own topic, please do sign up for it. You do get three activity points for that. And this will be going on throughout winter quarter as well as spring quarter. So if you're not available winter, you can do that for spring. Okay. Okay. So our second fundraiser of the quarter is going to be at Blaze Pizza. It will be next Wednesday from 5 to 8 p.m. You can either order online or in store. Um, if you do order online, make sure to input the code fund one at checkout in order for the proceeds to go to Psychive. Um, if you do um, order in store, make sure to show them the flyer to show that you're here to support um, Psychive as well. And don't forget to send your receipt to us as well uh, too, because um, you can earn two activity points by um, making a purchase. Um, so if eat pizza isn't really your thing, there's another fundraiser that's happening right now, which is our Krispy Kreme donut fundraiser. So we are selling digital dozens that are $12 each, which is actually cheaper than like what they sell like typically. Um, so it's kind of killing two birds with one stone. You can support Saikai and buy donuts for cheaper than they actually are. Um, so the way that you can purchase this is either Venmoing $12 to um, that Venmo, or you can sell um, at that number. Um, please be sure to include your full name, our mail, and indicate that it's for the Saikai fundraiser. Um, and yeah, the... Uh, at the end of it, so like at the end of week seven, um, all of the gift cards will be sent out at that time um, through the Saikai email. Awesome, thank you. Now we're gonna have Caitlin present on our site. Okay, hello, I'm back again. So as I've said before at our previous meetings, our site is going to be happening this year again. It's, it's our fifth annual undergraduate psychology research conference. And we have actually opened our abstract submission forms as of now. Yeah. Now, so it is now open. You can um, get to that using the tiny URL there, or you can also scan the QR code. On the uh, Google Forms, there will also be a link to the abstract guidelines. So you can check there to see what are the requirements in order to submit the abstract. 
and what you need to submit an abstract. This year is a little different. We've opened it up. So previous years, you have had to be a neuroscience or psychology major or minor. This year, we do not have a required major or minor as long as your research is related in some way to psychology or neuroscience, you can submit your research to be presented at our psych. So it could be in the field of biology, education, sociology, marketing, as long as it is somehow related to psychology or neuroscience. And uh, the official our psych date is going to be Friday, May 26. If you don't want, to submit your research, you can always join us as a committee member. Um, you will get three activity points for spring. The membership application, the member application is right there. So there is the link, there is the QR code. The application closes February 26th at midnight. Please do apply. Yes, and you can be a committee member and present for our site at the same exact time. So this is something, this is a great way for you to add to your CV, your resume, uh, just wonderful experience. And so, yeah, again, the application is this Sunday, so please do not miss out. It's not this Sunday, it's next Sunday, sorry. And of course, elections. Y'all, if you are eligible, please, 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 please consider applying for officer as well as program coordinator. We still are hosting our team office hours. If you have any questions, uh, it's in the email. It's also in the Discord, so be sure to check it out. If you have any questions that you just want to ask online, you can go to the Discord category uh, on the Discord. So, yeah. And, yeah, so you can see the guideline application as well. The guideline link and the application link. The office applications do close next Tuesday. So please take advantage of the time you have left. And we will be voting on our last general meeting. That is going to be week eight, which is Wednesday. Okay. And of course, stay connected, email, subscribe to our mailing list, check out our website, Instagram, Twitter, all that sort of stuff. But without a further ado, we are going to get started with our panel, Psychology in the Field. And we're going to start off with actually having our panelists uh, introduce themselves for a little bit. So when you see your slide, please do unmute and share. Okay, I got to go first. First, thank you all for having me here. Um, it's nice to just be asked to come and speak to you all. I am a UCR graduate, so it's like even better to, to get to to get to come and talk to you all. Um, a little bit about myself. I am currently living in the Bay Area. Um, I am in the fourth year of my doctoral program. I have two more years to go until I graduate. Um, I'm currently doing autism assessments um, during my practicum site. And I have already finished my master's. I got my master's in sports psychology. Um, and if there's anything you all want to know about any of these things, I'm here. Ask me any questions. I'm open to them all. Um, yeah, I have, and as it says here, I've worked in school settings. I've done trauma and crisis support and work with athletes and autism now. So, yes. <laughs> Hi guys, thank you guys so much for having me today. My name is Nia. Um, I am, as of right now, an associate marriage and family therapist. I recently graduated from Truro University Worldwide, um, which is out in La Costa, um, LA area, but I reside in San Diego County. Um, so what I do on a daily basis is I do talk therapy. Um, I talk to individuals within the population of young adults, millennials, and the geriatric population, just providing psychotherapy from that end. Um, and before that, I was also working in the applied behavioral analysis field as a registered behavioral therapist. I did that for about a year during my senior year of undergrad at Cal State San Marcos. Um, and with that undergrad, I graduated uh, with the social sciences, but my primary focus was in psychology. My secondary focus was in um, social sociology, as well as the last focus being in communications. Um, and working as a registered behavioral therapist, I feel like that really opened up 
um, my interest in the therapy field. Um, but then during uh, the pandemic, I decided to go into the marriage and family therapy route. So that's something that I truly enjoy. If you guys have any questions and feel free to um, ask me any questions later on. Hello, everybody. You sure? Yes. Okay, good. All right. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Wesley Sims. Uh, I'm actually a professor here at UCR. But in a previous life, I was a practicing school psychologist. Let's see what it says about me. here. <laughs> yep, that's correct. That's correct. That's correct. I got lots of letters after my name. Uh, went to graduate school a few times. Couldn't get enough. Um, I uh, worked as a practicing school psychologist uh, for a long time in the St. Louis, Missouri area. Uh, and then kind of bounced around after that um, as I completed my doctoral studies, uh, rural Missouri, misery, as I used to call it, um, affectionately, of course. No. Um, and then I spent some time in New Orleans and Alabama and bounced around uh, before landing here. Uh, introductions, that's it. Yeah, I got. Um, Awesome. Thank you so much. So without further ado, I'm actually going to hand this alongside to our secretary, Justin, to moderate this entire panel. All righty. So just for a quick question, uh, just as a general thing, tell us more about what exactly it is you, that you do on a day-to-day -day basis. And generally, to make it more simple, what is a day in your life like? I'll give that a start. Um, as a graduate student in my fourth year, a day in my life, typically right now doing autism assessment, I wake up in the morning and once I get into work, I am playing with kids most of the day, doing autism assessments. Most of the time it is while learning how their play styles are interacting with kids. Um, when I finish doing an assessment, I typically move into having one-on-one -on -one supervisions with my supervisors, also have group supervision. So there's a lot of support in the field as you're training and learning. You might feel that it's really daunting to have to learn so much. You have to keep so many different theories and frameworks in your mind, but there has been a lot of support in every step of my process. Um, and then I spend a lot of time writing the assessments and you know formatting them the way that they should be um, given to patients, the way they're given to doctors and clinicians. And then, you know, being in grad school, I then go right from doing those assessments in the afternoon, morning, jumping into class at about five o'clock and I'm typically in class till eight or nine o'clock on a given day, usually like two days a week. Um, and then, you know, kind of repeats itself. And I also, when I'm working, with athletes, I'm usually going to practices. I watch, spend a lot of time watching them at practice. And then we're having individual sessions, typically about an hour long, um, watching them at practice and then having themselves watch each other at practice. And it's a lot of just connecting and cultivating relationships and building trust and having a place where people just feel safe and comfortable to share what they're going through. Um, and that has been what my typical day looks like. Um, as for me, it sounds um, pretty similar to Austin's as well. Um, as I mentioned, I recently got my associate marriage and family therapist uh, uh, registration number in the state of California. And to be licensed, to be fully licensed, you need to be able to accumulate 3,000 hours to be able to sit into the board exam. So technically right now, um, I graduated in August of last year, but um, I'm still in the process of accumulating those remaining uh, 2,100 hours. Uh, so with that, I am right now working at a private practice and 
I am uh, still providing psychotherapy or talk therapy to those individuals or couples, uh, sometimes families as well. Um, my day-to-day -day basis kind of looks like seeing about six to seven patients a day, um, and that's on a 45-minute time frame per session uh, with the, each individual. Um, and some days it kind of looks different. There are some months where there may be a little bit more no-shows or cancellations. Uh, for example, during the holidays or summers, um, we will usually get a little bit more uh, cancellations because people are a little bit busier um, in their day-to-day -day life during those times. Um, and then since I am still accumulating those hours for licensure, um, I also still have that once a week group supervision as well. So again, there is a lot of support as to what Austin had mentioned. And then I also have individual uh, group supervision as well. Um, and then towards the end of the week, I also like to make sure that my progress notes are all completed for uh, the patients that I have. Um, and then sometimes um, I will collaborate with the psychiatrist or the psych NP and just really consult with them and share the symptoms that I notice within uh, each patient. Um, and then from there, they'll, they'll usually, you know, prescribe that medication since um, LMFTs usually aren't able to uh, prescribe medication. Okay, uh, typical day for school psychologist. Um, it varies quite a bit. Um, so rather than a typical day, I like to frame this as like typical activities. Um, and there's lots of bouncing around. You could do any number of things on any given day. It just kind of depends on what's going on. A lot of the th things that um, folks have already mentioned previously. Um, historically, a lot of what school psychologists do uh, is assessment, um, the educational equivalent of diagnosis. We determine eligibility for special education, or at least we're an integral part of that. Um, so, uh, you know, most days there's some sort of assessment activity involved. Uh, there's lots of paperwork that goes with that as well. Um, we, uh, we're kind of, I describe school psychologists as the, the individuals that preserve the integrity of the special education process from start to finish. We're kind of the people that keep track of the timelines because uh, maybe unlike um, the cl clinical world, uh, there are very strict timelines around doing what, um, what we do in terms of eligibility determinations. Um, so we give lots of tests, IQ tests, achievement tests, uh, social emotional behavioral assessments, uh, autism assessments, uh, depending on you know, the, the situation. Um, so it just kind of varies there. Uh, then another kind of big part of what I did as a school psychologist was consultation. All right, so um, teachers have various problems that they encounter, um, managing student behavior in the classroom. So a lot of what we would do would be consult with those individuals to develop behavior plans, uh, try to support um, behavior management, things like that. Um, lots of meetings, right? So lots of interactions with administrators, um, other service providers, speech language pathologists, OTPTs, um, counselors, um, as well as parents, right? We're often kind of the the go-between for um, parents. Again, we kind of preserve the integrity of this process. So a lot of what we do is communicate, you know, kind of this is what's going to happen. So sit in IEP meetings um, and talk with parents about, you know, what to expect and uh, manage the paperwork in terms of getting consent and things like that. Uh, then, you know, often as part of that assessment process, eligibility process, uh, there's writing up um, our results, disseminating that information in written form. Um, as well as in a, a meeting that's associated with that. We sit down and we explain the results of those assessments to, to parents and other team members. Um, then there's crisis response, right? If a kid is melting down in a classroom or um, you know something uh, unforeseen has happened that day, uh, often the school psychologist would be a part of or be responsible for responding to that, managing that. And again, some days all of this stuff would happen. Some days, you know, one of these things would happen. It just kind of varies. Um, the, the running joke is school psychologist wears a lot of different hats. So you have to have a, a good coat rack to hang your hats on in your office because you're always bouncing around doing a lot of different things on any given day. So uh, never a dull moment. Um, 
get to work with kids, get to work with parents, get to work with other professionals, administrators. Um, so lots to do. Thank you so much for answering that question. And uh, just before I forget, while you all were talking, I really noticed that um, there seems to be a really large community slash communication aspect to all of your work. Like with the with Dr. Wesley, you, you're talking with administrators, you're talking with your fellow team members, parents, students. With uh, with Dr. Uh, with Dr. Hopkins, we're talking about how to work with your teammates, how to work with uh, the people that you're assessing, and with uh, Ms. Nia, we're talking about um, trying to assess like issues with like in, within family therapy. If I'm, remember correctly and so i just wanted to ask generally uh how was that adjustment that you made like were you expecting that level of communication being required as part of your work and if so what were some adjustments that you made to your own process of working that would facilitate that amount of communication i guess i'll go first this time uh, yeah, I'm, I mean, one of the selling points kind of when I discovered the field of school psychology and was you know, kind of decided to pursue that as a career, um, one of the selling points was that you get to work with a variety of individuals doing a lot of different things. Um, and again, that was something that was kind of attractive to me. So, I mean, I, I anticipated having to work with, um, or sorry, having to work with, getting to work with a lot of different um, people in a lot of you know uh, varied capacities uh, various backgrounds experiences expertise um so yeah i mean it's something that i foresaw and kind of embraced wanted to, you know was attractive about the job um how i approach that uh it's such a i don't know it's a, for for me from in my experiences it's such a i don't know for lack of a better description like a chess game right so now as a trainer, we talk about kind of the hard skills that school psychologists learn. Like you administer, you learn how to administer your tests according to standard administration protocols, right? It's very rote almost, right? Even though the, the person changes, their responses change, like the, the, the muscle memory component to it. Um, but the harder part is the soft skills, the interpersonal dynamics, right? So it's um, it's this interesting chess game to kind of get to, to interact with individuals, to communicate with them, and in, at least from a school psych perspective, often get them to do something that they wouldn't typically do, um, provide an intervention, um, hear or accept an eligibility category that they weren't necessarily expecting. Um, you know, sometimes diagnoses and or eligibility conclusions can be, you know, difficult to hear for some folks. So again, you're kind of conveying this message, getting folks to accept or do saying things differently. So there's a there's very much a like a social influence element to all of this. It's a you know interesting little chess game, soft skills. And for me, those evolved over time, right? You try something, it doesn't work out so well. You regroup, you try a different tactic, uh, that sort of thing. Um, and of course, I wish I'd known then what I know now. And you know, it's one of those things. So each person, each interaction is probably going to require slightly different tactics and it's it's almost a little game to try to figure out exactly what you need to do in this in, in any given situation to to kind of accomplish what you need to accomplish um i i agree with dr wesley i feel like coming into this uh what is most important when interacting with um the different types of patients coming in because it's it is a very diverse population is just really having that cultural sensitivity and respect and really having that open mind when um you know trying to build rapport with these patients I feel like just having an open mind and just staying curious and being genuinely curious about the questions rather than making assumptions is what will make them feel comfortable and and opening up to you as a as a clinician. So um, those are one of the ways that I I usually like to approach uh, the session. Yeah, and I would really agree with that. At the school I'm at, they really focus on cultural sensitivity and just being aware of all the different people that can come across at any given time. Um, I'd also say 
you know, not taking some things personal that you might experience with a patient. Like they're usually coming to you at some of their worst times and experiencing some really bad things that may be happening to them. So it's kind of just taking what they're saying with the grain of salt and being able to, you know, move forward through that and knowing that um, it's not a, necessarily about you a lot of the times. Um, and again, what Dr. Sims was saying, you know, trial and error, you know, you try something, you figure out, oh, this worked. If not, being willing to give a, make a pivot and try something completely different and you just keep trying and trying until you realize that, oh, you have 10 skills that work now and you can try those again. And maybe with the next client, those 10 skills won't work, but you have another 11 that didn't work and you just try it again. So it's just a lot of trial and error. Thank you so much for answering that. And something that I heard from multiple of those questions were was this process of trial and error in learning how to approach your craft. And so my next question would be about that. So when that process of trial and error, how are you able to maintain your mental health? Because I can assume that making cert certain mistakes in the process might weigh more heavily on your mind. And so how, what were some steps or what were some things that you did to preserve your mental health in that sense? Um. For me, especially as a student, it can seem like daunting that you might have made a mistake and it's the biggest thing in the world that you didn't want to make a mistake while maybe your professor who's grading your paper might know about it or your supervisor's looking at it. But also, you know, there's usually a team out there of other doctors or consultants. So you always want to consult with other people. And that way that when you are trying something different, you know, you can ask someone else, was, is this what you would have done? How would you have approached the situation differently? And that way you can feel a lot more confident in the um, what you're trying to get across, what you're trying to do. I agree with um, Dr. Austin as well. I feel like just really having those case consultations is the way that I feel really supported um, in those types of situations that really helps to, um, you know, just kind of like refresh my, my mental health and just stay positive about it and really seek support and guidance um, throughout that process. Uh, so again, just having that support and, um, building more self-awareness as a clinician as well, and also not really, you know, taking things personally from each patient. So again, just taking things with a grain of salt because you don't really truly understand what they're going through. They're, they are sharing that experience, but again, just be mindful and, and patient with them as well. And that will also help um, your mental health or your mental state as well. Yeah, so I, I think for me, <clears throat> I learned pretty early on to set limits, um, uh, both in terms of like the amount of work that I was doing, right? No matter how much work you get done, you know, uh, at work, right? And then you take work home, you can do work there. But when you get back, there's still going to be more work waiting for you, right? So protecting and honoring and, you know, limiting the amount of time that you spend doing work, like my time is my time. Um, Right. And in that time, you know, do kind of the more traditional, you know, things that we think of for self-care, exercise, sleep, um, socializing, you know, seeking social supports, things like that. Um, and just, again, kind of remembering that that time is for that. Um, this is a, you know, as a helping professional, it's a stressful job. Um, you know, as our other speakers have noted, like sometimes there can be a tendency to kind of take some of that on uh, right? when you're in this you know, stressful, difficult situation that, you know, your, your client or student is experiencing. Um, but to, you know, to leave that there, let that, you know, be theirs to some degree, not that you're not empathetic and supportive, uh, but you can only do, you know, so much to help that situation. You got to remember to take care of yourself and, and limit what you take on. Thank you all so much for answering the question. I know that the process of maintaining your self care and maintaining your mental health while being in such sometimes stressful situations can really uh, weigh heavily on your mind. So your insights on that were greatly appreciated. And this is a reminder to all of our in-person folks and our online folks. Uh, you are more than welcome to ask questions in the chat, but uh, if no one has any further questions uh, or to give you 
more time to generate those questions. Uh, the next question I would like to ask is, uh, what is the more rewarding aspect of your work? Is it like the self growth that you in, that you feel once you like complete tasks or like mess up, or is it like or is it something else? It's, yeah. Okay, I guess I'll start this one. Um, so for me, uh, it's just. A couple of things. One, like knowing you, that you've made a positive impact on you know the educational trajectory of a student, right? And then that has ripple effects to that student's family and the community um, that you know they will you know, be a part of um, and are a part of. Right? So there's definitely that aspect um, for me, um, and that this might explain the career change for me. Um, it was always uh, very rewarding to support um, school psychologists that were entering the field training, right? So providing supervision um, through practica and internship experiences to kind of the, the school psychologists that were, you know, in the pipeline um, and uh, promoting uh, more non-traditional um, or, yeah, uh, more progressive uh, practices within the field, um, trying to shift away from, you know, the test and place model, uh, as opposed to, you know, promoting more genuine intervention uh, and prevention type activities. So when those, well, those efforts came to fruition and we saw, you know, success, growth um, in the system, as well as, you know, for individual students, it was always really rewarding. And then, of course, creating future school psychologists that do the same thing also very rewarding. There you go. Um, I think it's rewarding um, personal growth, definitely as I'm especially matriculating through all these different courses and classes, writing dissertations, personal growth, seeing how far I've come since starting and being able to you know, understand a lot of these different um, diagnoses in the DSM and feel like, oh, wow, I can pick up on this a little bit quicker. I can see these things like that's rewarding in itself. But then also, you know, like if you're a psychologist and you're seeing a client for weeks on end, months on end, you know, towards the end of like seeing them, you've grown, you've grown to see them in plenty of different phases amongst throughout that time. And sometimes seeing the client and remembering who they were when they first walked into your office needing some help and crying or you know feeling very stressed out about school, whatever they were going through, to seeing them saying, bye, I don't really need this service anymore because I'm able to handle this on my own and I have the coping skills to deal with it. I think that's really rewarding because you're able to teach something to someone that they can just take with them and they won't have to use you. And one of my supervisors told me, like, as psychologists, we want our job to be obsolete. We want one day for us to not be needed, that these people can have the skills so that they can, you know, handle the life's pressures on their own. I agree with that as well. Just um, being able to see that you're making an, a huge impact on these individuals' lives. Um, it motivates me when I see progress in the patients and I see that they are building that awareness and insight of their behavioral patterns or thought processes. Um, and then as for me, I would say for myself, it's also personal growth. Um, you know, being a part of a minority population, I really understand how difficult it is to be able to access mental health care. Um, so the motivation for me is just being a mental health care advocate for BIPOC, such as individuals like myself. Um, I identify as a cisgender Asian American female, um, and just being a part of the mental health care field is such a rewarding feeling just for myself, because I know that there aren't many of us out there, um, in this field, in this field specifically. So, uh, just that in a in itself is a very rewarding feeling. 
It was really great hearing from all of you. And uh, I imagine it must be very rewarding. Like I'm already finding my work in psych very rewarding. I can only imagine how rewarding doing the work that you do every day and having such a positive impact can be. Uh, but we actually do have a question in the chat from uh, Alexandra, and it's a question for Dr. Sims, actually. What experiences do you recommend for students that are aspiring to be a school counselor or in school psychology during their undergrad or after their undergrad, especially in preparation for something like graduate school? I feel like this is a trick question. Hernan, do you want to answer? Um, well, Since we just talked about it in class today. <laughs> uh, so honestly, it kind of depends on uh, your perceived path or trajectory that you want to, you know, maybe go. Uh, because there's within school psychology, there's different um, there's different levels that you can enter the field, right? So there's a educational specialist, um, and then there's also the doctoral level. Um, and so doc, uh, the educational specialist is kind of the the entry level uh, degree. Um, it allows you to work in schools as a practicing school psychologist. Um, takes about three years, two years of full-time study, one year of internship. Um, and it's much more practitioner oriented. The vast majority of school psychologists have an EDS degree and, and their credentials. Um, and it takes obviously less time than a PhD. Um, uh, so for EDS level, um, I would recommend involving yourself in, um, you know, Situations where you can interact with students, um, like pre-K through 12th grade, um, doing after-school programs, doing summer camps, just anything where you're interacting with kids, um, tutoring, you know, supporting, working with uh, those students. Um, you uh, could involve yourself um, in things like um, being a paraprofessional, substituting more educationally oriented activities. Essentially, you're just gaining experience um, with the populations that you anticipate working with um, or environments that um, are kind of close re close re closely related. Um, so you could be a behavior tech, um, get some experience in the ABA world, supporting you know, students with autism or significant development and play issues. Um, Another potential avenue for EDS level and definitely uh, encourage folks to get involved if you're planning to go the PhD route um, would be to involve yourself in some sort of research activity. So volunteer for a lab, um, get experience uh, in research doing something. Again, the, close, the, the more closely related it is to the field of school psychology, the better. Uh, but research skills are you know, uh, things that can generalize across different topics. So um, um, uh, I would also recommend uh, getting to know at least one or more professors fairly well. At some point, you're gonna need letters of recommendation. Um, so getting to know folks um, that uh, have letters after their name and you know look, look fancy on, on paper. <laughs> so when they write you a letter of recommendation, it looks, uh, looks good. Um, so, and we talked again today in class just about um, getting to know them beyond just, I was in your class, I got a good grade. Can you write me a letter of recommendation? You know, probably want to have them talk a little bit more about um, you than just that, uh, which again, uh, volunteering uh, to work in a research lab or supporting you know, faculty research, something like that is always a good way to do that. So um, yeah, those are kind of the big ones. Oh, I would also... Um, I would also encourage you to, and this would go for any any field of any kind. If you're considering going into a career, uh, go talk to somebody that does it, um, and go observe if you can. Go spend some time with them, seeing what they do, kind of on a daily basis. Right, it's one thing to hear about it, but then to go and actually see them interacting with other folks, doing the job that they do, is a it's a much different experience. Um, and you know it's a it's a big commitment, so you want to make sure that you're informed, you know, and have a pretty good idea of what you're getting into. Also, a potential way to get another letter of recommendation. Well, thank, thank you so, so much. And it appears Alexandra, who asked the question, says that she's already doing pretty much everything that you recommended. So seems like she's on a good track. And uh, actually, we do have another question in the chat from Liana. Uh, what should students consider when deciding to pursue a graduate program in school psychology versus one in developmental or clinical child psychology? 
and I guess to add on in like sports psychology, for example, for Dr. Hopkins. So generally, what should they consider when deciding to pursue a graduate program? I just did a lot of talking. Anybody else want to <laughs> jump in? Yeah, I can add to that. Um, I would say to consider the school's, you know, background and what they um, believe in, you know, are they looking for like culturally sensitive? Are they aware of like the culture and what's happening? Um, look into places close to you, honestly. It, it is a lot to commit to school and doing things that like going into a program like that. So just considering where you're at and what you're willing to put yourself through, the time commitment um, is very important. When thinking about getting into sports psychology, honestly, when I was at UCR in 2018 graduating, I had no idea what sports psychology was. Um, so it was really just a lot of research and trying to align my degree with what I've already liked. I really enjoy sports and it's now a growing field that I've gotten into. So it's like just finding what you like and the way that you can put your interest into building off psychology. I feel like psychology is so big and so broad and that if you can find something on music, like art, you can probably find a way to incorporate that into what you're doing. So it's just really researching um, what you want to do with it. I agree with that as well. I feel like, you know, after um, you graduate from undergrad, I would just highly suggest uh, to start applying in, um, in jobs that are related to psychology. So for me, again, I decided to go through the ABA route. Um, and originally I thought I wanted to become a BCBA, which is a behavioral analyst for uh, children and adolescents with autism. Um, but then as I uh, stayed within that field, I later on realized that I really enjoyed talking to individuals and families um, more so on the psychotherapy end. So I feel like just, just giving um, like different uh, psychology related jobs a try and then figuring it out from there. Um, I would say that it roughly took me about two years to go back into uh, grad school as well. So really just take that time to explore what you like or enjoy. Also, I just want to add, be comfortable with, you know, trying new things. You might have this idea of this is what I want to do. This is going to be my passion. And even a lot of my professors talk about they had this great idea of what they want to do. And they've tried that. But now 20 years into it, they've been doing a completely something completely different. And it's completely OK. Like once you get into it, you can just keep trying different areas. And you might be an expert in multiple things, but just be willing to and open to the world of psychology in, in its whole. Yeah, I would just reiterate um, some of the things I've said already. So if you're considering, you know, a career path, uh, go find somebody that does it and talk to them. Uh, doing research, reading about it is, is a great start. Um, but a lot of times um, what you might read, you know, is kind of a general summary of the field uh, might not align um, exactly with, you know, kind of what happens on a day-to-day -day basis um, when you're actually doing the job, right? The disconnect between um training and, and reality um so uh go see it go experience it you know to the to the best degree that you can um uh do do research about you know income and hours and um you know impact on mental health and long-term physical health and, and things like that um just to so just broadly do research um and and you know firsthand research, uh, if possible. And I, I feel like most um, professions or individuals in most professions, particularly the helping fields, um, are pretty open to sitting down and talking with folks that are interested in pursuing a career um, in that field. So uh, yeah, and then, you know, once you kind of decide on a path and you're trying to pick a program, there's lots of different factors to uh, consider. 
um, theoretical orientation, you know, commitment to social justice, um, alignment with your values, funding, uh, some programs or not all funding structures for graduate programs are, are created equally. So uh, lots of different things to consider. Uh, faculty interests, um, the amount of time that faculty will have to spend with you once you're in the program. Um, again, do some research. Talk to students that are in the programs, talk to alumni, compare and contrast as many as you can. Thank you all so much. And I know that could be a very difficult question to answer when you're simply in your undergrad years. And it's, it was really your, the insights that you brought to the table about how you decided to go into what you wanted to do and how you wanted to pursue that were very insightful. So thank you very much for answering that question. And I believe we have a question from one of our in-person uh, members. Uh, you raised your hand. Uh, this one is for Neil. Uh, you mentioned about the emphasis of your assumption about the 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 assumption about but uh, one of our members asked generally, so you mentioned something about being culturally aware and aware of like different things when you are interacting with patients. And so I think you were trying to ask how you or And yeah, so generally, how did you actively uh, apply that? And how did you generally avoid making assumptions when you were interacting with patients? Um, so for me, I, I feel like genuinely just as a, as a person, I really enjoy learning about different cultures. Um, so I feel like for me, I feel like it just came out of genuine cur curiosity. So during the initial assessment, I really like to ask, you know, what the patient, uh, identifies as and, um, how was their upbringing like? So just having that open conversation of what their childhood was like and how their cultural background is uh, growing up um, is one of the ways to really be uh, culturally sensitive about um, or culturally sensitive uh, with a patient. So rather than just making assumptions, just asking out of genuine curiosity. Does that answer the question? All right, so it is 447. So uh, just a reminder for everyone, if you still have questions, please feel free to ask them. But uh, going forward, actually, uh, I'm just curious because you all seem to have many experiences with your patients that are very, or that are on, on varying degrees of person, like uh, what's the word? Personal experiences with your patients. And so I was just wondering, uh, how well do you remember like patients between sessions? Because I can only assume you only see so many patients per day or per year or per week. So how well do you remember each patient's and yeah. Um, I can start with that one. I think your progress notes are very important. Um, though you do build like really strong relationships with your clients, you might not remember exactly what they told you last week and the story about however was happening in their life. So keeping diligent notes about key points and key topics has been really helpful. Um, but those relationships that you build, it's not like you just forget about your clients as soon as you close the door. You take them with you in a lot of places. Um, maybe you're just walking down the street, you might remember something that they said or something, and you just have to kind of process through that. Um, but I think your clients are there. They, you don't forget them. You just ha you might not remember exactly what they were saying or talking about. I agree as well. I feel like since you are building that rapport and that relationship with each patient, it's kind of almost hard to forget them because you sometimes, you know, outside of work and you're doing something, sometimes you remember what they say. So I feel like that's what makes the relationship um, like stick with you. Uh, so again, just really building that that rapport and that relationship, I feel like it is it is a little bit difficult to forget. 
who that patient or client is. Ditto. Notes. Notes are good. And, you know, it's like uh, the more you work with the person and even information about that person, um, the easier it is to remember them. So you get, you know, obviously you interact with them directly, but then, you know, once that situation kind of ends, you transition to the next one where you're maybe writing up your notes or, you know, you're, um, you know, summarizing, you know, a person's background or whatever it might be. So then you're essentially rehearsing that information again. Um, and you do that, you know, several times over the course of your time with someone, um, which helps kind of, uh, you know, helps you remember them. Um, and then of course, at least for me, I worked with kids a lot and spent most of my time in elementary schools uh, and they're prone to saying and doing hilarious things, which also helps you remember. <laughs> remember them i'd also like to add on one on the other end though as a psychologist and you do more assessments and with assessments you only meet with that person for the assessment you don't do the work with them you don't um, do the treatment plan for them like necessarily do the day-to-day -day work so as an assessment writer you might see more clients and only have them for a day like for me doing autism assessments Today, I just did a three-year-old girl. I will not see her again. Someone else will come in tomorrow and I will do that assessment and not see them again. So there's just depending on what your job is asking you as well. Thank you so much for answering that question. I know some people may find it hard to believe that that therapists won't forget them or something or so it's it is kind of comforting to know that as psychologists you are also involved and very invested in your patient's well-being and so actually with that in mind I was just curious what what general criteria do you use to understand a patient's progress I know uh, Dr. Hopkins earlier mentioned that part of what's so rewarding about his job is that he gets to experience when patients feel like they don't need his help anymore and so I'm wondering how generally you all understand your patient's progress and how you were able to gauge that basically. It's my, in my world, um, I don't know, it's probably a little bit different than, you know, more counseling, you know, traditional talking therapy oriented. Um, we use data, right? If you don't have data to back up what you're saying, it, didn't happen, right? Uh, so we do assessment, kind of ongoing assessment to, to uh, monitor the progress of students that we're providing support for. Um, sometimes that is, you know, self-report data, um, but it's still data. We, we work diligently to attach um, a number of some kind to progress relative to the referral problem. Um, and, when, when doing more traditional um, like talk therapy counseling type stuff, when I had the opportunity to do that, uh, it was something that we didn't necessarily do as much of. Uh, it was much less frequent, um, but we would still try to, you know, repeat kind of intake assessments to see if there's changes relative to their reporting of symptomology and things like that. But for me, very much data-driven um, progress monitoring type activities. I would say for me, um, within the psychotherapy field, it really depends on the type of facility that you are going to be working in or doing your practicum at. Um, so usually for nonprofit uh, organizations, I would say that they utilize a lot more assessments um, within each session. Um, so one of the... Uh, the nonprofit organizations that I had my practicum intern at, it's called Union of Pan Asian Communities in San Diego County. And at that uh, facility, I worked with um, homebound and socially isolated seniors, um, providing mental health prevention and early intervention uh, to that population. And that one was very, uh, I would say, assessment driven uh, before each or 
during the beginning of each session, we would use the pH 29, which is a scale that measures um, depression and asking about, you know, suicidal thoughts and ideations. And that's one of the ways that we would progress, uh, uh, you know, evaluate the patient's progress on that end. Um, but as for a private practice, like working as a psychotherapist in the private practice uh, field, I would say that we don't really utilize a lot of assessments as well. So it, it is more like a free flowing uh, talk therapy. Yeah, and they've covered mostly the um, like talk the ARP type and the school assessment. So I'll even talk a little bit about sports psych in that way. Um, we do use like outcome measures and confidence ratings and having someone report their own ratings. But then we're also, you know, talking with the coaches and how's this person now showing up a little bit better. Um, talking with if it's a younger kid, bringing in their parents and getting their parents um, reports on how the player has um, changed or improved and also asking the player. Um, we don't really typically count wins and losses in terms of like how a player is doing in the in those terms of like their health improving or mental health improving or not, but just on how they can be showing up differently, um, the way that they see it and the way that others see it as well. All right, so it is 46, so this will be the last question. Um, and so I think generally, I think you meant, you all had a little bit of, you all mentioned this somewhat, in that when you were pursuing psychology, eventually you did land into your, I guess, niche. And so I just wanted to ask, uh, what came first generally, your interest in psychology or an interest in your current career specifically? For me, it was my interest in psychology. I had that interest in psychology in high school, applying to schools. I had no idea what I would go into it for, or what you know it would bring me. But as you just continue to go down that path for myself, I was able to, you know, figure out, oh, I can align this with what I want to do, and I, this is also something I could do. And then realizing now that even though I'm in my doctoral program, there's still so much that I can accomplish and still do and touch. And it's just, I feel like it still develops. So more so my interest in psychology first. I would say for me, it is my interest in psychology first as well. Um, during undergrad, I took psychology 101 and that's what really opened my interest to learning more about psychology. Um, and then from there, after um, I graduated from undergrad, that's when I started to explore the different types of psychology related jobs as well. So that's what really opened my interest. Same. <clears throat> I had no idea that school psychology was even a thing. Um, I just happened to have a random guest speaker in one of my last classes in, as an undergraduate um, major in psychology. Had no idea what I was going to do with my undergraduate degree in psychology. And uh, yeah, I had a guest speaker that talked about school psychology, uh, talked about um, all the, the great aspects of becoming a school psychologist, including summers and holidays off, job security. Uh, good pay on and on and on and on. So uh, did some research and ultimately ended up pursuing that as a career. Uh, so yeah, definitely general interest in psychology first. With that, uh, I would just like to say thank you all so much to the panelists for answering all of our questions. And uh, for all the attendees, we will be providing uh, the, these slides. And I believe, uh, yeah, so Austin actually, uh, or Dr. Hopkins for that matter, apologies, uh, posted his LinkedIn. Uh, I think we will be also sharing your LinkedIn's and information if possible. Uh, and yeah, so I will pass this back along to our president to finish up. Just, can I make a plug? Oh, yeah. Not, not necessarily for me specifically, but kind of. If you are interested in uh, school psychology, um, we offer through the School of Ed, uh, psychology in the schools, 
EDUC 183. Um, I've had folks from psychology take it. Um, it's basically an introduction to school psychology. So what uh, is this class called? EDUC 183, Psychology in the Schools. Uh, it's, it's a pretty healthy sell, sales pitch for school psychology, but we also talk about uh, other potential avenues, um, kind of the overlap between education, psychology, and career options uh, there. So uh, a more formal, uh, and you get some credit towards graduation too. So got to like that. Oh, there probably are. I don't know what they are off the top of my head. I think it's maybe an advanced course. So you have to kind of have general prerequisites out of the way. But off the top of my head, I don't know. I'm sorry. Yeah. So typically it would be like education 10. That's the most common Probably, one. Yeah. Yeah. But just send me an email and I'll waive it. <laughs> Unless I get in trouble for it. And then I never said that. Any other plugs? <laughs> if not, thank you all so much uh, for coming to our general meeting. Um, we will stop the recording. Again, you will be receiving the slides and the recording afterwards if you want to rewatch or just go through the slides. I will also go ahead and share the QR code and tiny URL link in case you didn't get that in the first place. So I'm going to go ahead and share that now.